Thank you for tuning in to the Starkey Multifamily Podcast. I have with me Brandy Shotwell. Uh, Brandy and I have worked together for a while on financing multifamily together. Um, so Brandy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. So thanks for having me, Reed. It's a pleasure to be on the show. My name is Brandy Shotwell. I um, am from Reno Capital Management. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. I've been financing properties for over 20 years, but the last five years I've been concentrating in commercial property and I funded over a billion dollars in, in, um, in debt for uh, debt and equity for various projects across the country. Awesome. Well, so we're going to kind of do this in two parts. So uh, part two, we're going to have a little bit um, addition. Um, but this one, we're going to talk about kind of the basics of the different financing for apartments and different ways of going about doing multifamily financing. Uh, so the first question, uh, you know, where can one go for multifamily lending? So there's, you are a, a broker, a mortgage broker, but there's other sources. Can you tell us about what the different sources are? Absolutely. So you can go through a broker. You can go to various lending institutions throughout the country. You can also go to your local bank for financing. Um, the most popular type of uh, loans that are used for uh, multifamily financing is uh, bridge debt, which I'm sure we'll get into later, and Fannie, Freddie, and HUD. When you go to a bank or a broker, what questions could you ask to determine if they're a good fit for you? So that's a good question. I think it's going to be more about the synergy that you have with that with that um, particular person. For me, I'm all about building a relationship and knowing who you are and who your family is, just because I want to I want to build that long term relationship with you. You don't want to be just a number to anyone. Uh, for me, I want to be with you from start to finish throughout each process that we go through. And that's super important for, for clients to build those relationships and have people that can advocate for you. Uh, one of the plus sides of using a broker over going direct to a lender or to a bank is they have one product that they try to fit you inside of this box per se. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So it's like, hey, you know, this is our program. We have to, it has to fit this. It has to fit these guidelines. Whereas a broker is going to have access to local banks, you know, private debt funds, family offices, just all type of lending uh, situations across, across the board. And a broker will be able to uh, shop that property for you and make sure that you get the best deal that they have versus saying, okay, it doesn't fit into this box so we can help you or these, are, you know, this is all we can do. So I'll, I'll add to that a little bit too. I think part of that is, so with, with a broker, you are paying a little bit extra, uh, usually in origination costs, which has to pay for their labor and their having all those connections. Uh, but some of that benefit goes toward you know, if, if you are doing lending with some simple deals and maybe you do a few that the bank may go through and work and then you've got that relationship built up and you've got that, you know, that uh, good solid relationship, but then you maybe have a funky deal that doesn't fit in that box. Now you've got to go to a mortgage broker and you've got to build that relationship up on a difficult deal. Um, yeah. So I think from my perspective, and maybe you can build on that, having that relationship on all the deals with somebody that has a large network of sources to go through is incredibly valuable. Um, whether or not it costs you maybe a little bit more upfront, but knowing that when I bring a, a strange deal to that person that I've already built a rapport with, that they're going to be able to get me funded. And maybe they, you know, maybe they'll have to work a little harder at it, but they know that I'm worth their time doing that. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So let's talk about um, the types of financing. So, you know, there's, there's Freddie, there's Fannie, uh, there's HUD. There's various different types of lending programs. So when you talk about Freddie or Fannie, one thing I want to make sure we're clarifying, they are not the ones putting out the money, correct? They're not. So there are lenders, big institutions that are putting the money out, uh, and then they're being backed by Fannie. Uh, so let's, can we hear that in your words, who could probably explain it better than I do? 
Yeah, so uh, Fannie and Freddie, and they also have, they also, I know a lot of people are familiar with them on single family. It's basically the same entities, but they they, they insure the loans that, um, they back the loans, like you said, they insure those loans that the lender funds for you. And so they have their own guidelines and the lender is the one who fronts everything. The lender is the one that you deal with, but they have to follow those guidelines by the the agencies, the Fannie, the Freddie, the HUD. They have to follow those guidelines to fit what, you know, what isn't, what their parameters are, you know, in terms of funding. Yeah, and then the insurance essentially lowers the risk for the lender, which yes. encourages them to lend in an area uh, because it's much safer for them than lending maybe directly to me. And so that way they can get the rates lower and, and everybody is happy. Okay, that's correct. So let's talk about the general terms that you can get with uh, in the institutional or agency debt, which okay. is Fannie or Freddie. And then maybe we'll talk about some advantages of going non-agency with those, some of your private lenders and things like that. Absolutely. So with Fannie and Freddie, your terms, you know, 30 year amortization, um, up to 80% leverage, which is super important because that lowers the, the down payment for you. Just um, in case somebody is not familiar, can we explain what amortization is um, before we go too further? That, that is the payment schedule on how the loan is paid back. So the, the loan is amortized over 30 years um, and it it lowers your payment by being amortized over 30 years versus let's say 20 years or 25 years. In some cases, that is the amount of time that it takes you to pay back. But on commercial real estate, they amortize it over 30 years to give you that lower payment, but then they have shorter terms, you know, which is usually five, seven, 10 or 12 years if that loan balloons at the end of that, that term. Okay, and then a balloon payment means that it's due at... So, All want. so, you know, maybe on uh, something that's more familiar to most people is a home mortgage. Yes. So that is a fully amortizing loan at 30 years. And then, uh, which means at the end of 30 years, it's completely paid off and you own your house free and clear. Yes. But the commercial, the Fannie and Freddie is doing the same payment, but they're putting a balloon on it, which means at the end of that balloon, the balance is due in full. Exactly. Correct. Okay, cool. Um, so go back. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to make sure anybody listening knew the terms we were saying there. So yes, yes. Okay. What was I saying? Well, the different, um, different, types different of long terms. Okay. Terms. Yes. So, yeah. um, 30 year amortization, 80% loan to value, loan to cost, uh, where the lender will give you 80% of your total cost or either 80% of your purchase price which lowers the amount of down payment that you would need to bring in. Um, they have very low interest rates. The loans are based off of the, well, as of now, the rates are low, right? right. <laughs> so, you know, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they weren't, but they've been really great the last few years. And um, lower rates, higher leverage, 30 year amort amortized loan, and they are non-recourse. That's the biggest thing. That's one of the biggest difference, but differences between uh, commercial lending and, you know, single family lending. You know, single family, you are personally liable for the loan that you take out. And on commercial lending, if it's non-recourse, because they're, they're both options, recourse and non-recourse. But in this case of Fannie and Freddie and uh, the, the agencies that offer financing for multifamily, these loans are non-recourse, which means that you are not personally liable, but they're, they, they're non-recourse with bad boy carve-outs. And I, I hear a lot of people say, well, really, what I like, it's really called that? No, it's really called bad boy carve-outs. Um, there are a lot of things that can trigger a bad boy carve out, but the most popular thing is fraud, right? So you want to make sure you're honest about what your net worth is, about what your liquidity is. Um, those are things that are very important. Be honest about the financials that you provide on your property, because all of that can be considered a bad boy clause that can trigger them to foreclose on the property and come after you personally. But if the, if the property itself just fails, um, no fault of yours, 
there is no personal liability for that and it's non-recourse. So they cannot come after you personally for it. And all the loans are closed in an LLC. And I think that's uh, important. We're, we'll touch back on that um, on that carve out later when we talk about some of the requirements, um, which maybe that's a good transfer point. Um, so talking about the various requirements to getting those loans. Um, and then, you know, so sometimes we'll have somebody sign for the loan and there, because it's a non-recourse loan, their liability is low, but it's not zero. Uh, so we'll get back into that. Um, so some of the requirements. Um, so what if you want to get Fannie and Freddie, and they are different, you know, what are some of the requirements that you're going to need to have? So a minimum, I know they have a, a minimum loan value. Um, is there a maximum loan value? Is And they have different programs like small, small balance loans. Um, can you talk about some of the differences between those? Yeah, absolutely. So um, on, on Fannie, you have Fannie, the minimum loan amount is for Fannie is actually 750,000, but some lenders choose to do a 1 million and above. So, you know, just because their minimum, minimum loan amount is 750, you won't find every lender that's willing to go down that low because commercial across the board, when you, when you talk about dealing with the agencies and, and multifamily, you wanna stay above 1 million. That's when your terms are the best. That's when you can get non-recourse. You know, really, it doesn't matter what the product is, you really want your loan amount to be above a million dollars. Uh, Fannie, you know, is, is a favorite for a lot of investors because it provides, Fannie provides the CapEx budgets as well. So if you're going into a value add property and you have, a, we call it CapEx, but a rehab budget um, that you want included in the loan, we can roll in the cost of your rehab up to $5,000 per door. Now the property still has to cash flow. We need to hit a 1.25 debt service coverage, meaning that we need to have enough income to cover that mortgage payment 1.25 times. So it's important to make sure we have that. But a lot of investors favor Fannie because of that, because they're able to do the value add plays and still get permanent debt financing with a low rate, great amortization, high leverage. Uh, Freddie is uh, another program that's used. A lot of people don't know, but Freddie does allow you to roll in closing costs. You know, Fannie allows closing costs, rehab dollars, and purchase money. Freddie does uh, purchase money and closing costs. So that's, um, that's also a good benefit. Same thing, 1.25 debt service coverage, up to 80% um, leverage a 30-year amortization and really good rates. So the biggest difference between the two is leverage, uh, uh, higher leverage because it includes CapEx is on the Fannie side. Um, but in terms of the terms, they're very similar. Are you going to get a better rate going with uh, the Freddie than over Fannie? Uh, so it, it's very difficult to say because there's so many compensating factors involved in that. Freddie, one thing I, I do want to know, Freddie does have an SBL program where loans that are under seven and a half million are considered small balance and um, they have special pricing different from their regular program. And a lot, a lot of times the interest rates on the Freddie SBL can be the Fannie, Fannie deals, right? Regardless of the loan size. Um, but um, but because it is, it's not that much of a delta, right? It may move the needle a little bit, but it's not that much of a delta when you talk about having more proceeds. So usually I give my clients both options, a Fannie option and a Freddie option, where you may have a better interest rate with Freddie, but you're gonna have higher leverage with Fannie. So plug both options in and see what works better for you and your investors. So that's, um, that's a good segment into um, purchasing things for points and various ways to change the interest rate. <clears throat> so, you know, some, some obvious ways, you know, you've got the term of the loan for the different amount of years that you want to have the balloon for is going to affect the rate. But, um, you know, we've also talked about various things that you can do depending on, you know, how you want your defeasance to look, which we didn't talk about what defeasance is yet, but um, basically your prepayment penalty 
Um, and then I, I've heard somebody, you and I have never talked about this, but I, somebody told me one time that he had assumed basically recourse for a non-recourse loan and he was able to get a, a lower percentage based on that. Um, so you can verify if that's true and how that works, but let's, can we talk about the different things that would change the rate and things that you can pay points for or do to lower or raise that rate? Absolutely. So when you're talking about local bank lending, most local banks are recourse, but you know, historically, it's been said, oh, well, if I take a recourse option, I can get a better rate uh, versus non-recourse. And that may be the case in some loan programs, but not when you're talking about Fannie and Freddie. Their program is non-recourse. They don't offer a recourse option. So even uh, if I had the balance sheet for that, they won't, Fannie and Freddie will not allow me to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was something you asked. Well, what was your question? The, the various uh, interest rates uh, and how it's affected by the term of the loan or um, yes, okay. the fees and it. things like that. Yes, yeah, so recourse for not recourse, you know, when you're talking about Fannie or Freddie, that won't mean anything. And the, obviously the term, you know, so uh, depending on, you know, the state of the market, you know, a, a 12 year may price out better than a 10 year or a five year may price out better than a seven year. It's best to get those options. What I like to do is structure the deal according to your exit strategy, you know, and give you a little bit more time where, you know, maybe a seven year makes more sense for your exit strategy. Um, and we need to determine, okay, well, if you're going to sell in year five, but, uh, we need to structure your prepayment penalties around that. So your prepayment penalty can also affect your interest rate, whether or not you do a yield maintenance or whether you do a step down. Yield maintenance always prices out better. You know, for the last few years anyway, it's always priced out better versus a step down. A yield maintenance, um, it, it, it's they give a slightly lower interest rate on the yield maintenance because it gives the bank it gives them some level of certainty, like, okay, this loan will probably not be prepaid early, right? Mm -hmm. With a step down, you get a slightly higher interest rate, but it gives you, the sponsor, the investor, a little bit more flexibility because you can understand exactly what your prepayment penalty will be and when it will be that, right? So if we do a five-year step down, you know that in year five, your or year four, your your prepayment penalty is two percent. So you know if you go to sell or refinance that property at that time, you know exactly what that penalty will be, versus having a yield maintenance prepay that is basically uh, based on the bonds, um, and it's a it could be a sum total of what the interest is through the end of the the term. So even though you're paying off in year four or three, you'll have to pay interest through year five if, if that's the term that you're in versus having a step down. So you gotta kind of decide what's best for you. And unfortunately, with yield maintenance, there are there's a yield maintenance calculator that the lenders use and it, it calculates um, in a, a range right, of, of where the prepayment penalty could fall because none of us actually know what it is um, and where it will fall. So uh, we can give you a range like, hey, it will be this to this if you pay it off in this year. Um, but with the step down, you know exactly. So a lot of investors prefer the step down, but it is, it is a little bit more costly. Maybe, you know, depending on the program, the location, um, the, uh, the unit size, that's another thing that can affect your, your interest rate, um, the property size, how many unit, units you have at, at that property. So if it's under, let's say, uh, 50 units or 30 units, I can't remember exactly um, the number, but you can maybe have a 10 basis point increase for smaller properties on certain loan programs. So those are things that, that will affect your, your interest rate. So it's best to make sure that you have all the options going in so you can make the most of informed decision for you and your investors. Yeah, and that's certainly where I think a lot of people get lost is, is it's very difficult to, to say, you know, I wanna exit this in five years or seven years 
because you just don't know where that market's going to be and their their timing. So how at the end of the loan you have what is your grace period of uh, not hitting the defeasance or the prepayment penalty? Um, you know, it's a very small window. Yeah. So my suggestion is to to start your uh, plan about six months to a year in advance so that you know exactly what your strategy is. Um, if you need extensions, if you need additional time, the lenders are usually flexible and will work with you. Um, so let's say if you're at five years and six months, they're not just going to call the loan as long as you're being transparent with them and saying, hey, here are my documents. We're going through the refinance process. These are the hurdles that we've run into. Um, you want to be transparent with your asset manager throughout the entire process. So my suggestion is to always start six months or more before, you know, six months to a year before. You, you'll have a better idea of where things stand and what they are and what your options are so that you know, okay, now I need to execute. Because you know, as well as I do, these loans take 60, 90 days to close sometimes depending on, you know, everything that's going on with it. So we want to make sure that we have enough time. So six months, you know, you think, oh, like that's, you know, especially on the single family side, that's a long time to start the loan process, but it's really not when you look at everything, when you look at it as a whole. Yeah, and what is, so what is that window? So when does, so if, if I have a five-year balloon, um, you know, without asking for extensions, but when is the earliest I can sell without prepayment? Yeah, okay, so I have been told um, five years, three months is really where you are. You don't really want to go over that. Uh, so that's why I said six months leading up to, and it will be spelled out in the mortgage documents, but you don't have that much time past the five years to yeah. start the process. <laughs> you want to get it started ASAP. It's certainly a small window. I mean, when you talk about, like you, like you had mentioned, you know, it's, you know, you've got to line the buyer up and then you've got to get their financing set up and, and there's such a small window for, a very lengthy process it, it's kind of uh, stressful and then you know if you throw a 1031 into there it'll make it even worse but it will it make it even worse yes yes so for. yeah it, it is a very short window um past that and and i'm going to tell you especially from the local bank side um i know you know borrowers and sponsors who have gone you know one two years over that <laughs> Mm -hmm. because maybe they couldn't get it refinanced, not on multifamily, but um, on other asset classes. And they, they didn't have a choice but to, uh, you know, grant the flexibility because, you know, if it ever came to that point where you're like, okay, I've done everything I can to refinance it, you know, where, 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 are, where are we at this point, right? Um, and yes, especially if you're going to sell it. So I was talking about from a, a refinancing standpoint, but if you're going to sell it, definitely start talking to that broker a year prior you know they can give you an idea of what the value is on the property you can kind of talk about condition and where you need to be if there's anything that you need to change you need to have that broker look at your financials and make sure that everything is in order for that buyer coming in you know there may be some things that weren't accounted for and you and i both know we've seen some very tricky financials, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, give that broker time to help you. So definitely reach out if you're going to sell at the end of your term, reach out at least a year in advance, you know, six months to a year, six months when I think about that process is not even enough. Yeah. So um, going back to the agency debt and the requirements, <clears throat> we, we kind of veered off of away from the agency debt, but um, so there are some basic requirements that the borrower is going to need to have. Um, can you tell us what those are? Yes, absolutely. So um, we need a net worth equal to the loan amount for uh, all the sponsors collectively. So uh, um, if it's if it's three uh, partners that are going to invest in a multifamily property and they are, let's say the purchase price is 10 million, they need to have a net worth equal to that 10 million. So whether it's one person that has 100,000 and, and then the other two have you know, 5 million each, how, however it needs to work out. 
but it's a collective effort. So not just one person, but the, the partnership needs to have that in terms of uh, net worth. We also need 10% post-closing liquidity. So we need 10% of the loan amount um, in liquid. So a lot of people say, well, can I use my life insurance only if you cash it and put it in your checking account? We need to make sure that we have 10% liquid in the bank and accessible. It doesn't have to be uh, put in an escrow account, put in an escrow account with the lender, in an escrow account with the lender. It just needs to be in your checking account and available. Okay. I like that you touched on the, the point of it doesn't have to be you. So I think a lot of people, you know, they, they're intimidated or don't even look at multifamily investing because they know, okay, so I don't have a net worth of $3 million, so I can't buy a $3 million property because I can't get financing. But it, like you said, they could have 100000 or really, in theory, you could have zero and have some other people that have that $3 million collectively. Yes. And I've closed plenty of loans where, you know, one partner or maybe more than one partner didn't have the net worth or liquidity. Like you said, they had close to zero. So this multifamily is a team sport. Um, and I know and I know you've probably talked to people that had this issue, too, when they come from single family into multifamily, they have a hard time grasping that they'll need to partner. Well, I know what I'm doing. You know, I've I've been doing real estate for 20 years, or I've done retail, or I've done this or that. Well, okay, this is different. You want to make sure that you have partners. I've never, you know, in five years, I haven't done a loan with just one person. It's always been partnerships. So that's why strategic partnerships, partnerships is just important because this is definitely a team sport, and it's about partnering with the right people you know, and making sure that you have partners that you can trust. Going back to that bad boy clause, <laughs> you want to yeah. make sure that you have partners that you can trust as well. So yes, it's a team sport. You don't have to do it alone. You really can't do it alone. You know, let's say you even have the net worth and the liquidity. Well, they want you to have the experience too. That was the other thing that I didn't touch on, but they want to make sure that you have multifamily experience and multifamily experience is just not owning a five unit, you know, two blocks away from your home. Multifamily experience is owning, you know, 20, 30, 100, you know, doors um, and being able to take those properties down, hire the right management to come in place and manage that property and be able to uh, get agency loans, you know, they want you to have overall good experience. Yeah, and that's that's a great point. I'm glad you brought up the, the experience component because it's, you know, the chicken before the egg, you can't, how do you get experience without doing the loan? So you have to have somebody on your team that can that can give you that experience. So that's, that's a great, a great point. <clears throat> so, Last, uh, I think maybe the last topic on the the agency debt, one of them, and I forgot which one, you can get a supplemental loan on, correct? Yes, yes, that is, that is Fannie, uh, you can get a supplemental on, and Freddie, that's not small balance. So as long as it's not a small balance, Freddie, so Freddie over seven and a half million, and then on Fannie, you know, the loan size doesn't matter, you can't get a supplemental on it. So let's talk about what a supplemental loan is and why you would want that. Absolutely. So a supplemental loan is, you think, think of it as a second mortgage, right? That you get from, you obtain this, this supplemental loan from the um, lender who did the first loan. So it comes in second position to the first loan. It's coterminous with the first loan. So even if you have the first loan for, let's say five years, you've got another five years left, that supplemental can be, can be put on the property to, for, for purposes of cash out, for rehab, or for, um, uh, to purchase other property, whatever it is that you need that supplemental for to pay back investors, whatever the case may be, and it will balloon with your first loan at the same time. But think of it as a second mortgage, um, and, and this also helps with certain strategies. So two instances that you can use as supplemental. 
for one, if you are purchasing a property and you have to assume the loan. So you need to assume the loan. Well, now if you assume this loan, you've got a, a delta between what the loan balance is and what the purchase price is. Now, of course, you can just pay the down payment, right? But if you want to be able to leverage a little bit more and get a little bit more you know, purchase dollars or rehab dollars or whatever the case is, you can see if the property qualifies for a supplemental loan. That will give you additional dollars to use for down payment, to use for CapEx, and that's when you would use a supplemental loan. The other strategy is, let's say you purchase a property year one, um, but you have a 10-year loan on it. Well, in year five, you're ready to pay back your investors, right? You, wanna, you want to refinance, but if you refinance and you've got a 10-year loan, you're going to have a, a hefty prepayment penalty. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that um, what I was going back to before, that your uh, your prepayment penalty and your terms are structured around your exit strategy. So we did a 10 year loan and year five, you want to pull cash out. We can put a supplemental loan on that property to pull cash out and it will be structured just like you would a refinance. You're going to get equity up to 75% of the, the value of the property at that time. Um, and then you can use that money for CapEx to pay back investors, you know, whatever the case may be, but you won't have to pay off the loan and pay the prepayment penalty if you would refinance at that time. So if, and you said the terms are the same, so if- It's called terminus. So not necessarily the terms uh, as far as the interest rate, because the interest rate is usually a little bit higher, okay. but it does, the, ter the other, you know, the terms outside of the interest rate are the same. So yeah. I couldn't get the original loan at 4% and then when interest rates are 8%, I can't go get another 4% loan. No, you can't. You can't. Okay. Yeah, it would price out, it would price out a little bit more than um, where, where, uh, where the current interest rate is, but it will still balloon with your first loan. Okay. Can, if, if you're looking at buying a property that is a, for an assumption so that clearly says that Fannie is the preferable one so you can get the supplemental because that is one of the biggest problems when you're assuming a loan is the spread between what you're paying and the mortgage balance because hopefully for the seller they've raised the value of it from when they paid for it so now you're getting their uh their their loan to value plus what they raised the value of it up okay. um, so that supplemental is critical if you're buying a property, can you pre-qualify for that? So if I was assuming a purchase today, could I go to you and say, Brandy, I need to make sure I can get the supplemental on this and you would be able to get me locked in before I closed on the sale? So yes, uh, this is something that, that um, for my clients, no matter what, I'm gonna help you out through the process. So if you come to me, um, with the supplemental. I can't remember if we worked on the supplemental before, but I'm going to work out the details. I'm going to tell you exactly um, what it will shake out at. You know, okay, this is what this, yes, I think you can get a supplemental on this. This is about what the loan would be. This is about what the rate would be. I may not be able to actually originate and help you through the process all the way in terms of of how I would if you were doing a refinance or an acquisition, that's not um, a, 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 an assumption because you have to work with the bank who originally uh, originated that first loan. But what they will do, and sometimes the brokers do this uh, in the beginning when they have a seller come to them that, that is gonna sell a property on an assumption, the broker will reach out to that lender and get the terms of the supplemental because Remember, these are asset-based loans. They're, they're based on the property. So we can, we'll have an idea of what that supplemental looks like. Now, once you have the property under contract, you'll start working with that lender to put that supplemental, you know, get that supplemental going and, and get it in place. But you have to go through their process. We can't pivot to a different lender in that case because we have to use them. We have to follow their guidelines. So that's something to, you know, to, to think about. You'll have to, to deal with their uh, whoever the first lender was, you'll have to deal with that lender in order to get that supplemental. But you could you could definitely have a for sure 
knowledge that you're going to get it before you close? Yeah, absolutely. So that they, they will issue. It's actually just like going through um, the process. Going through an assumption is is like going through a full loan process. You know, because they have to qualify you. You know, you have to provide financials um, and your plan for the property, just like you would if you were uh, going to purchase the property and use new debt. Um, but at the same time, you will be going through a supplemental. So it, it would be worked on in tandem, you know, okay. as you get to closing. Absolutely. I got it. Okay. Um, so I think that's about it for the agency side, which okay. is um, well, maybe one more requirement to touch on. So there is um, occupancy requirements as well. So yes. the property requirements. Yes. Yes. So what are some um, of the property requirements that they want to have? Yeah, so they, uh, a stabilized property is a property that has been occupied at 90% for 90 days. So if you just remember 90 for 90, that is considered a stabilized property. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule. You know, we may be able to get a waiver to go below 90, depending on what the story is. And that's, you know, one thing I tell people, there's a lot of flexibility um, in these loans, they give us the guidelines, but there, there, there are times where we can get exceptions, you know. So 90 for 90 is considered a stabilized property. Anything less than 90, um, you know, and I've been able to close uh, agency loans where property was in mid 80s on the occupancy because the story that we had and, and actually what happened. But um, if it's less than that, then we need to do a bridge execution, which we forgot to touch on. But well, I was I was transitioning to bridge. Okay. But that's, that's how we were yeah. getting there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if we if we have to if the property is not ninety percent occupied for ninety days, let's let's underwrite it. Let me underwrite it. Let me look at exactly what's going on, and I'll be able to tell you, hey, I think we can get this pushed through, or no, we definitely need to do a bridge loan on this. So that's perfect. So what, what is a bridge loan and uh, why would you need that? Awesome. So a bridge loan is a loan that is used to get you from purchase to stabilization. And so there are a lot of different reasons why you would use a bridge loan. You know, you could be 90% occupied, um, but let's say you've got Remember, Fannie only allows $5,000 per door. Well, let's say you have a budget of $7,500 a door for your rehab, for your CapEx. Well, it may make more sense to do a bridge loan where the bridge lender, they don't have a cap, a per door cap on your, on your rehab budget, and they'll, they'll give you the $7,500 per door for your rehab and roll that into the cost of the loan. Um, the bridge lender is not looking for a 1.25 debt service coverage, you know, so we have bridge loans available down to zero debt service coverage. So um, the, the bridge loans are looked at differently is to get you from purchase to stabilization. So it could be a lack of cash flow. Well, maybe the property is 94% occupied or 98% occupied and it's not being ran properly, it's not being managed properly. Well, the income isn't where we need it to be. The rents haven't been bumped. Because when we underwrite, we're looking at in-place income. So we're not looking at performa income, which I know confuses a lot of people because they're like, well, this is what I'm going to do to the property. This is where I expect income to fall in year one. We can't do that. We have to take in-place income and performa expenses. So we wanna know what your expenses, expenses are gonna be in year one, but we can't say, well, the sellers are expenses are 300,000 a year. Yours are 500, but we're just gonna take the 300. Well, no, we can't do that. We have to take in-place income and performa expenses and come up with our NOI. So a lot of times the, the income won't be there and, and the, we're so debt service compressed, meaning you know, we cannot maximize the leverage on that property. So if your goal is to hit, you know, I've underwritten properties that were fully, fully occupied, but the highest leverage we could go is 50% because it's just not cash flowing. Um, and nobody, you know, I don't know any investors that want a 50% loan. The rate will probably be good, you know, but mm -hmm. I don't know what those returns would look like at a 50% leverage. So um, taking out a bridge loan would be our option in that case. Or let's say, 
you know, the occupancy is 70 percent and you've got ten thousand dollars of door uh, rehab that you need to do you would want to use a bridge loan in that instance as well. So bridge loans are for properties that are not stabilized, that need rehab, that are not cash flowing, that need repositioning, and they get you from purchase to stabilization. They're short-term loans, usually less than three years. They have extension options available. So if you haven't executed your plan in that two years or three years, whatever the case is, you do have extension options available. They are more costly you know, because um, you're going to have a usually a 1% prepayment penalty. It may be more depending on the actual property, the location, and it is, it costs more. Your legal fees are more, your appraisal is more, everything costs more. So it, it, it's not always the best option, but you know, I, there are three different tiers of bridge. So tier one bridge actually prices very competitively. Um, I closed a bridge loan not too long ago and we were at uh, in the fours on the interest rate. So some people hear bridge and they automatically think hard money. Don't mm-hmm. always think hard money, you know, so that that's my tip of the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, can we talk about those tiers? What, what do the tiers mean for the bridge loans? Yeah. So tiers has a lot to do with, um, you know, the location where the property is the the actual occupancy of the property right because if the property has a vacancy of 30 um 30 percent that's considered a higher risk right so that will fall into a tier three which is more of a hard money where your interest rate is going to be over nine percent well let's say um your loan amount you're gonna you'll get the best pricing on bridge loans if your loan amount is over five million that's a that's a good space when you're under five million and a lot of people don't understand that when you're under five million um the options i have to shop your loan become very small and if it doesn't fit on a bridge to agency one of my small balance bridge to agency lenders then now you're automatically a tier two just because your loan amount is less than five million um so in that instance your rate may be seven to nine percent Right. Um, but let's say Dallas being, you know, a major MSA, you've got a property here where I'm located and, you know, you've got $10,000 a door, but, you know, let's say we're 70, 75% occupied. It's just a clean deal. No murders, you know, n- no, no hairy contracts, nothing funky with the income or some, you know, something that's not showing on the T12 and we're able to collect everything we need. We would consider that a tier one where we're pricing in the, you know, five to 7% range or maybe even lower. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe just a quick question. I don't know if that matters so much, but why do you think the lenders prefer the larger balance loans? Um, I think it's because of the money aspect because they can make, you know, to, to go through the process. And I mean, you know, the process is not e- an easy task to mm-hmm. go through. Um, it's just not enough um, money to be made on a loan that's, you know, a $1 million bridge loan where, you know, you're paying $50,000 for legal or $20,000 for legal. Like the, it just doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. So if over $5 million, that's the that's really the sweet spot where the the fees make sense on that and the work that you go through makes sense on that but it's a lot of work to do for a small amount of compensation so a lot of lenders say we won't go over five now can i get them to go down to four usually especially if they like the 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 sponsor team right but mm-hmm. not all the time so that is really it. It's just not enough money. That's what I hear in my industry. It's just not enough money, you know, for us to go down to two million or down to three million. Um, that's that, that's that's the answer. Okay. And then the last one I wanted to say is, um, so it doesn't always have to be the same property. So if you own many houses, even single family or small multifamily. Um, that may not qualify for non-recourse debt on their own, uh, you can get multiple of them, pull them together and come together and get uh, what's called a portfolio loan. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about how that would work? 
Absolutely. So a portfolio loan is for, um, depending on the lender, two or more or five or more single family properties that we pull together and we put one loan over all those properties. Um, I think the minimum loan amount is somewhere between, depending on the lender, is five to seven hundred thousand. So it goes down a little bit lower. Um, and uh, it's non recourse, it's closed in an LLC, and the rates are actually pretty good. So you, it, it kind of streamlines the process for you um, when you have, let's say, 10 homes or 30, 20 homes, 30 homes, and you know, you have one mortgage over all of them, you can refinance and do a cash out. You can even purchase them in, um, in one loan. You can, you can purchase and do a refi at the same time if you want to, and they don't have to be in the same state. Um, and it just, it, it helps you because one, uh, if you've done enough single family, you know to get permanent debt on a single family property as an investor is going to show on your credit report. You know, maybe you can only have 10 properties in your, on your credit at one time. Well, this takes all these properties, puts them, puts them into an LLC. It doesn't report to your credit. So it frees up your credit. You can purchase, you know, you can keep purchasing. And then after you get so many, you can take those, refinance them and put them to another portfolio loan. So um, it's, it streamlines the process for the investor. Um, it also helps free up your credit report because now you own these assets, but they're in an LLC and they're not reporting to your credit. Yeah, and then, so what happens if you wanna sell an individual one? So if you have so 10. If you allow you to sell, I, I like to tell my investors that if that's something that you wanna do, make sure that it's a, it's a long-term strategy where you wanna hold it for you know a certain amount of time. Over the years, they've become um, a little bit more flexible on you selling properties out of your portfolio loan. They require that you pay down 125% of the property's value that you sold out of that portfolio, um, but they do allow you to do it. Okay. So it's not something where you want to get into this and, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to sell this property this year and that property, you know, in a six months, you know, that's not the loan for you. But if you own these properties and it's a long, long hold strategy, it's a great, great option. Can you get those as fully amortizing or do those have a balloon as well? Yeah, they're third. Yeah, they have a balloon. They have a balloon. So they're 30 year amortized, but it's five year and 10 year available on those um the of course the 10 year has a higher higher uh interest rate on it five year price is out better but um if it's a long-term hold do the 10 year okay well and yeah have the step down and the yield maintenance prepayment penalty and all that good stuff is structured just like agency yeah, and, and if you are growing if you do the math you know you're going to want to pull that money back out anyway so having that balloon, um, maybe that's the reason there is not fully amortizing loans because the people doing this understand that you want to pull that capital back out. If you're just having that money sit there and do nothing for you is is uh, is absolutely useless. Pointless, so, right? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah. When you do the the IRR calculations, you will see that it does not make sense to do a fully thirty year amortizing loan. Um, exactly. Unless the interest rate went through the roof, but. Um, yeah, yeah, I th think you're good to pull out anyway. So, well, that's all I have for the regular financing. Do you have anything to add? Did I miss anything? I think we hit it all. We hit all right. all. I mean, it's yeah. so much more like we could talk about this for like the rest of the day or till tomorrow and I could just keep going and going and <laughs> but for the basics. I think we've got it covered. Yeah, and I think that'd be enough to get started. And, and um, so let's let's finish this video off by giving people where would somebody get a hold of you, Brandy, if they wanted you to help them get financed on their multifamily endeavor. Absolutely. So you can reach me, my cell phone. Um, I don't remember my office line. That's horrible, but I don't. But um, my my cell phone is four six nine six two six seven nine seven nine. But my website is renocm.com. You can reach me through there. It also lists my office number on there, um, and you can also email me brandy at renocm.com. But I am more than happy to answer any questions you have. 
um, help you through your underwriting process. I do tons of underwriting for investors. I would rather you reach out to me in the beginning and we narrow it down. Reed knows that because uh, <laughs> that's super important. Reach out to me in the beginning. Let me help you underwrite that property. And you know, that way you can structure it, structure your LOI accordingly before you even, you know, submit it to the broker. Is is the 7979, is that the one your yes, office one? So, yeah. Yeah, it's, oh wait, uh, I have it right here, Reed. Card. <laughs> so it's 469-929-9538. That is well, not yeah. Got it. And we'll put it in the show notes as well. Um, so thank you. And we'll uh, join us for part two, where we're going to talk about kind of the current situation and what's going on and, and kind of the values there. All right. Thank you.